today. Um, we are going to be focused on an issue that, you know, I think is front of mind for many of us here at, at AU, um, especially kind of in this contemporary context. We really want to talk about our values here at AU of both free expression and dissent, we should say, and inclusion and really explore the, the many ways in which these, these values are deeply uh, intertwined and complementary, and also some areas where they run up against each other, right? And how do we sort of think about those um, together? So we, my name is Amanda Taylor. For those of you I have not yet met, I use she and hers pronouns, and I am the Assistant Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at AU, which means I get to work closely with the incomparable Dr. Fanta Ah, who is here on our screen. Um, and many of these wonderful colleagues across campus who you'll meet today as a part of our, our panel. And what we're going to do, um, just to kind of give you an overview of the session, uh, is we're going to have Dr. Ogg welcome us, talk to us a little bit about sort of the current conversations here at AU around free expression and inclusion, and some work that has been underway over this past year with a working group of faculty and staff from across the institution, many of whom will, who will be here today on this panel um, around uh, really looking at our policies here at AU and our values um, and really spending a lot of time kind of thinking about how we, we update those to really reflect where we are in this moment at AU. Um, so Dr. Ah will kick us off and then we will have a panel discussion from three fantastic colleagues, uh, Professor Lara Schwartz, who's here from the School of Public Affairs and the Project on Civil Discourse, as well as Jairus Williams, um, who is in our Dean of Students office, the Associate Dean of Students and also the Director of Inclusion Support in our Dean of Students office. Um, and then we've got our interim assistant vice president, Regina Curran. Um, she focuses on student engagement area. Um, and she'll, she has also been the co-chair of this working group that, that Lara and Jaris were both a part of. So Regina will talk from the kind of policy perspective as well um, about where we are today. So we'll have our panel. And then we're going to move into a case example. You have to dig in today. We're going to try to warm you up and then ask you to actually get your brains working and think about how some of these questions and ideas might actually show up in your classrooms or in your uh, mentoring and context. We know many of you teach in the classroom. Many of you teach in other ways um, through other ways of engaging with our campus community. So we're going to ask you to really dig in um, in small groups to a case study that we'll have in breakout sessions. Then we're going to come back together, share out some themes across the breakout sessions and leave you with a few resources um, and ideas for next steps as you move into the, the year. So that's our agenda for today. Um, again, thanks for being here. And without further ado, um, let me turn it to Dr. Av to welcome us and set the context for our conversation this morning. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you to all of you um, for making it again, as Amanda said, would have certainly been a bit easier if it was in person, but we understand and we definitely have all adapted to, um, you know, to the different modalities. Um, this is an important conversation. It's a first, but it's not the last. Um, in my experience at American University, we're gonna scratch the surface and this is gonna resurface pretty much every other day, at least in my work. Um, when I hear from students, I hear from faculty, I hear from administrators, I hear from outside, um, organizations as well. And so we will be navigating this. Um, what I wanted to start us off with are sort of two key things. One is that we have had for as long as I've been here, and it's been over 30 years, um, a freedom of expression policy at American University. Um, about two years ago, as I looked at the policy, I said, you know what, it's time to really refresh this policy. There's been ongoing national conversations around this, and our policy is not up to date, and we really do need to refresh that. Thus, bringing together a working group in a collaboration with the provost on uh, taking a look at our policy and coming back to us with what they think should be our next level of engagement with this very, very critical topic um, when you think about the role of higher education and you think about the mission of universities. So that's the setting for the working group and Laura and Jerris um, were also part of the working group in addition to Regina um, co-chairing that and Regina co-chaired that working group with Tom Merrill from our School of Public Affairs as well. Um, and we had some folks from the faculty Senate involved and lots of faculty engagement in this process. So that's just the first thing I wanted to let. With that said, what have we come back with and why does this matter and why not? Two things. 
it was very clear that in um, laying out that free expression is important to the academic mission and that it is foundational to the academic mission of the institution, that there was agreement around that. However, there was really not the other part of this, which is why are we doing this? Why does this matter? So in addition to the policy itself, we came back with a, what we call a statement of values on free expression. And the key reason why the statement of values were important is because when we are confronted with these issues and when it is messy, because it becomes messy, it is important for us to go back and step back and say, what's the values that are driving this? And so that was an important frame and an important document. So from, from where we sit, the policy on free expression will always be accompanied by the value statement on free expression. And it's really important for our faculty, our staff, and our students to understand the interrelatedness of those two documents. That's a starting point. It is in draft form. It is pretty much ready to be finalized and will be published uh, you know, on the website. It will be probably on the provost website and we'll make sure that we find lots of different ways to disseminate that. But there were a couple of things that I wanted to just point out to lay out you know, the frame for our conversation and our engagement. First and foremost is the recognition that at, at AU, this is essential and foundation to the mission of the institution and the academic work. Second, that in this ethos and culture of inquiry, that we actually might be wrong about some things. And that in being wrong about some things, one of the things that is absolutely key is intellectual humility. Um, and that with that intellectual humility comes the ability to listen, to hear, and understand that there will be vehement disagreements that is very much part of what we do as part of our learning and knowledge creation. But this piece of academic humility is really in our statement of values and, and free expression, and it really centers that. So what does this mean? It means that sometimes in our quest for the culture of inquiry, not only can we be wrong about things, but we really need to be able to understand truth from opinions. And that that actually really matters. And that in addition, when we find ourselves confronted with these issues, with the intellectual humility comes this ability to recognize that in the pursuit of inquiry, we may cause harm to others. And in causing harm to others is the ability to step back and ask ourselves the question of how might we repair that in our engagement with the other? Not easy, um, doesn't always pan out, but it's an important, part of the philosophy that the group came back with. And I wanted to just start with that in terms of the value statement. Then going back to the, the policy itself, there are a couple of things that the policy outlines. One, it starts, of course, with the free expression in academic inquiry, including you know, upholding the importance of academic freedom. But then it also recognized that creative work and journalism may have other components that we need to be considering as we think about free expression. So it does highlight those. Then the document also talks about free expression in the classroom, free expression in community life, and then recognize that free expression, dissent, and campus protests are part and puzzle of, of our work. And so wanted to highlight some of these things because I think it's important. Now, with that said, we all recognize that free expression, there are limitations to the right to free expression. And I think we all know what some of those are. Um, expressive conduct that can threaten, of course, um, uh, expressive conduct that may violate other key policies. And so sometimes those are in productive tensions that we often, as we often like to talk about those. And then of course, it becomes important also, um, you know, conduct that may be, you know, for example, our student code of conduct, et cetera. So there are limitations to uh, the right to free expression and those are outlined here. And those are the same rights that we're all familiar with. We didn't come up with new and you know, fundamentally different ones than what has been sort of the norm within our higher education um, setting. So with that, I also want to then finish with invited speakers. There's a whole section on invited speakers. And what the invited speaker section really outlines is that we have a responsibility, whoever is the institutional partner that is inviting the speaker, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are fully present from when we invite speakers and that we take our responsibilities in how we shepherd those events and, um, and engagement with our outside speakers. So with that, I'm gonna stop there and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda. It's a lot. I'm, you know, I know, but 
once we go through the case studies and everything else, you'll see how some of these things get illustrated. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Manta, for that helpful uh, intro. And I think, you know, as you hear from our panel, you'll start to really see the articulation of some of this work in different contexts. So we've we've asked our, our different panelists to also kind of draw on their particular areas ex of expertise and, the, and the, the sort of domains in which they work most to share with you how, how they personally think about these issues um, and also to share some ideas, right, for some practical strategies that you might be able to take with you um, as we kind of move into the academic year and as you move into your teaching in the classroom starting in just a just a few weeks. So I'm going to first uh, on our panel, uh, introduce Professor Laura Schwartz, who um, will talk, you know, from her really robust perspective in this area, but also speak about the classroom context in particular, right, and some, some great strategies she has um, from her own professional work focused on issues of civil discourse and, and expressive freedom and, and um, again, tools that she has applied with her own students and actually with students across campus. So, uh, Lara. Um, thank you. And um, thank you, everyone who um, is um, has joined today. Um, I'm really glad that um, that so many people are interested in this topic. Um, so a couple of things um, that I want to that I want to cover. Um, I would like to talk about um, how this free expression stuff intersects with the classroom, which is kind of my focus. Um, maybe some resources that would be of use to you in thinking about this yourselves, and including um, what we have uh, going on at the Project on Civil Discourse, which is um, uh, you know, located within SPA, but um, available for help to the entire AU community. Um, and also note that um, you know, I'm going to talk to the CTRL people about this, but if people are interested in actually doing like a Zoom or a brown bag lunch or some way of talking about how you key um, setting the stage for great, robust engagement that is both respectful and intellectually free in your classrooms, um, I do have you know a whole talk on that um, that I can do. I even already have slides, and and we can um, we can talk about that as as the teaching issue that it is. Um, so that being said, um, when we look at a new free expression policy and we, you know, do this work together to decide what are our values, what are the contours of our um, freedom of expression on campus and how to clarify that. One thing that's important to remember is that classrooms are places where we shouldn't be, we can't be. Um, engaging in some kind of discrimination based on viewpoint or engaging in partisan activity. But they have been and remain, um, regardless of, of, of the policy, places where faculty are the managers of our time. So we get to um, apply neutral academic standards of rigor, evidence, relevance. We get to apply standards of community standards, including avoiding ad hominem attacks, speaking from your own perspective and not speaking for others. And the things that we all do as faculty and welcome new faculty, the things you'll be doing as faculty to make sure that a classroom is a space where um, people are having conversations that um, have two features. You know, one, that they are doing the things, the learning objectives and the learning outcomes that our, that our classes are designed to do. So we're, we're doing the work. And the other is that we're making ourselves accessible, welcoming, respectful of everybody who comes into the class to do that work. I put into the chat um, a resource, which is a project that I did for the University of California National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement on how to make those two values present in and with my uh, former AU colleague, Andrew Brenner, how to make those two things happen in the, in the context of your classrooms through your syllabus, through the, the community standards conversations that you have early on, et cetera. Um, so the things that you might be wondering, you know, is robust free expression, does that mean that I can't stop students from being unkind to each other? No, it does not. And in fact, other civil rights laws governing 
um, educational institutions like AU actually put us in a, in a position of responsibility to ensure people aren't harassing each other, people aren't making a hostile environment to one another. Um, so that's, that's sort of the context. Classrooms remain classrooms and classrooms remain places where thought is supposed to be free. We have this freedom to say, you know, are the orthodoxies of our time or the policies of one party or the other right or wrong remains, but classrooms are also less free in the specific way that they have standards. <laughs> so ha having, um, uh, you know, Dr. Ah mentioned um, just, just stating an opinion that's not a fact, um, that, that's not school. Um, I, I would recommend as a practice for faculty to be really explicit with your students, particularly your incoming first year students, and your new, but really all students, regarding the difference between academic dialogue and political dialogue. Political dialogue is my team is awesome, yours is terrible, and so vote blue, vote red. Academic dialogue has the disciplinary standards that we're all familiar with from our study and our work. Um, so I, I, we have lots of panels, so I don't want to take too much time. Um, ways to make sure that you're, um, that, that you're effectuating the, the balance of, of respect for thought, but inclusiveness for people <laughs> um, in your classroom. So I do, I do recommend the thing that I put in the chat. The Project on Civil Discourse, um, we have some resources available for you. So um, you can look at our site and I'll link to that while after I hop off, but we also have um, dialogue facilitators available if you'd like someone to be assigned to your class to lead a discussion on a topic like whether your professor's politics matters or the paradox of tolerance or how to get along with people across political divides. Um, you can just contact me and I will, I will put my email in the chat as well. And then we're also having a series of um, events this fall that I'll, that I'll also put our little flyer in the chat um, that uh, get to flexing, flexing students' muscles about speech and, and um, across difference. Um, my perspective is that um, respectful communication and free speech are college level skills like, like time management or research methods. And so we like to give people opportunities to try them. So we do have student-led um, discussions where a student can drop in and have a peer-led discussion of one of our topics, um, whether co-curricularly in the evenings or in connection with one of your class meetings, if you'd like. But we also have the Disagree with a Professor series Wednesday nights this fall, where students can practice um, disagreeing with professors like me. We even have one um, on how to disagree with your boss this semester geared to the master's candidates, but welcome to everyone. Um, where if you think your students would like to learn that, um, that practice of engaging in principal disagreement um, outside of the realm of you know, grades, <laughs> um, the, the series um, you know, can, can help them learn that skill. And I, I think it's particularly important for incoming students. So that's what I have and I'll turn it to my fellow panelists. All right, thank you so much, Lara. Looking forward to that. Amanda, your mute came you're up. Muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Just want to say, Lara, I'll, I'll be there trying to disagree with you on a Wednesday night. So thank you for this. I'm sure you I, I'm sure I, I will I will learn very, very much from that. Um, so I'm going to turn us now to our colleague, Regina Curran. Um, and Regina is going to speak to us again. Regina was one of the co-chairs of this working group. And Regina will speak to us a little bit in more detail, building on what Dr. Oz shared about the policy, just to give you a little bit more context and how that shows up in, in um, some of uh, Regina's work as well. Awesome, thanks, Amanda. Um, I, at the very beginning, while we were waiting folks to file in, we were talking about our various years of service at AU. And so actually I began my career at AU in uh, the spring of 2012 um, in our student conduct office. And the very first case I was assigned actually had to deal squarely with free expression, um, political discourse uh, and disruption of campus events. So my history at AU really uh, is, is based in exactly this conversation. Um, you know, and since that time, um, I guess I would just say my my lesson learned is that there's no easy uh, one size fits all solutions here. Um, and I think that's really what we wrestled with in the committee 
or the working group as we were discussing our policy this year. So I put a link uh, in the chat to the current policy that's going to be sunset soon. Um, if you are to click on that link, something you'll notice, it is very brief. Um, and it really is a list of those things that you can't do primarily in the types of circumstances I think you could imagine around campus activism, um, things like that. And while all of that is, is helpful and important, uh, I think the group agreed that it was incomplete, right? There, there's very little there about why, as an institution of higher learning, we care about free expression, um, about what we hope to do um, by having an environment that allows some free expression, but also that acknowledges, I think, the reality that by leaning in favor of more freedom around expression, there will and there can and will be harm, right? Um, the, the group acknowledges, and, and we had a lot of discussion around, there's no real way to write a policy that can address all harm and allow for an expressive environment in the way that we expect uh, you know, a higher education environment to be. Uh, and so the question then it goes beyond the policy, right? The, the policy is going to be helpful. Um, I, I really look forward to you all being able to see this thing that gives a lot more substance to the why. Why does any of this matter? Or why are we doing it? Why do we believe in this as an institution of higher learning? Um, but the questions go beyond that. And it, it really gets into the agreements that we make you know, with each other in the various communities that we exist in. Um, you know, you think about our students, they often live, learn, and work on campus, right? So they're a member of a variety of different communities within this one space. Um, and so, you know, the ways in which we assist them um, in setting up those communities, those spaces, um, help them shape discussions um, in ways that think about, you know, this tension between the potential for harm and and free expression, um, I think are really important. Um, I uh, come from a, a conflict resolution background, among other things, um, and had a mentor who uh, really thought about all human interaction as conflict. Um, and, uh, and it resonates with me um, from the sense that all of it has the potential for conflict, right? There's always the opportunity for misunderstanding. Um, and so I think what I hope to impress upon, um, you know, folks, and as we continue the conversations this year with students, faculty, and staff around the new policy, that the policy itself is the floor, right? It is not the ceiling of the best work that we can be doing um, with each other uh, in how we engage with each other and how we set up our communities and how we tackle hard issues, um, you know, but it can give us the baseline for, for how we begin those things and what we minimally uh, can expect of each other, you know, as members of this community. Um, so I think if we kind of use it from that framework and think about, okay, if this is the floor, right, there's still work that we're going to have to do, there's still building that we're going to have to do, um, and just anticipate that we need to engage in hard conversations, ideally before the conflict erupts, especially if you are, you know, a faculty member in a class where you know full well uh, the topics that you're, that you're discussing this year um, could bring tension and conflict. Um, I currently in my role uh, oversee offices that are dealing with diversity and inclusion and student involvement. We have student groups and orgs, um, and there's a lot of opportunity for conflict um, and, uh, and coming across this policy um, with those various groups. And so the ways in which we proactively engage with them to think about, you know, how do you want to show up in this space? Um, you know, this is, this is what we minimally expect of you as a community member, but but what do you expect of yourselves? What do you expect of each other? Um, and how do you how do you do that? I think those are important conversations as well. So um, you know, I'm happy to kind of dig into some discussions about uh, about the policy where it's relevant. You will find much of the content of the current policy in the new policy. Um, a a key um, you know change perhaps that I will mention um, is you know in the policy basically it lists a, a number of things in which you know you cannot engage or that will violate the policy. Uh, and it does talk about um, disrupting or interfering with educational or other activities of the university community 
In the new policy, you will see uh, that language has been changed um, to talk about a substantial disruption. Uh, and we really do think that that's important to the framing of, um, of this environment uh, that we're trying to, to make because um, you know, it matters whether, you know, what the impact is, right? And, and it matters um, that, uh, that we allow folks to, I think, sort of start to wade into some of those, those difficult areas uh, and those gray areas without automatically sort of cutting off speech. Um, also, that language has some real legal basis and, and, you know, a real framework that I think we can point to and will give us some more substance to speak about. But, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that even though we I think we've improved upon the language. Um, there's still a lot of gray, and uh, and and there's still a lot that we are all doing as members of this community um, and in the work with our students uh, that will help. I think give real life to um, to what we're doing. So uh, I think a lot of it is is built in all of our interactions uh, in the classroom and outside of the classroom every day. So I look forward to that continuing that discussion. Thank you, Regina. I'm wondering if I can ask you to share an example I've heard you share in other contexts where um, what might be an example of a distinction between a disruption and a substantial disruption. So sure. maybe that that student event that you've that you've sure. talked about in other places, it to me, it gives a little bit of um, context that I think is helpful. Absolutely. So recent example, and this example made the eagle, so I'm not sharing anything that, you know, would be inappropriate for me to share. Um, but essentially, uh, over the course of this past year, we had a, an individual student, just one, um, show up at an event hosted by a student organization uh, to protest that event. Um, the event itself, the way it was set up was the students uh, who were attending that event were present in a physical space together. They were sitting in chairs and they were watching a speaker who was live streamed on a screen. Um, so they were able, they were engaging with that speaker, but the speaker themselves were not physically in person uh, in the room. Um, the protester uh, entered the space, initially um, held up a sign sort of at the front of the room, um, ultimately pulled a chair uh, up to the front of the room and stood on the chair. Um, that did result in, you know, maybe a foot or two of that person being in front of the screen. Uh, there was a question as to whether or not that was a disruption to the events uh, and activities of that student organization. Um, it could have been, I think, interpreted as a disruption. When we start to use the framework of a substantial disruption, now we have a different lens to look through. Uh, that organization that was hosting that event was still able to hear the speaker. They were still able to ask questions of the speaker um, and they were still largely able to see the speaker, right? So there was again, sort of a someone right in front of um, a portion of the screen, but the, the speaker themselves was still largely visible. Um, that would not violate a policy that you know defers to a substantial disruption of a university event. Um, and honestly, that's the spirit of the policy that we've had in place for a long time. And so that individual um, you know, did not find themselves running afoul um, of the student conduct code or other university policies uh, in this particular circumstance. And so I think the other thing that the working group was hoping to do was be transparent in our policies, right? Um, so clearly that's how you know it was interpreted and, um, and that's something to put out there. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, I, there were tough conversations that that happened around that, and I know one of the conversations that come up came up uh, was, well, what if what if the speaker had been there in person? And while I can acknowledge that I think a different analysis would have come into place, what's really important is that, especially when we're looking at our policy and when we're looking at shutting down speech and expression, we don't sort of play the game of, well, what if we were in a different scenario? Because we weren't. This is the scenario that we were in. And so we need to deal with the facts at hand. Um, I think those what ifs are really helpful for discussions like this and for discussions about how we set up our community and how we what we might expect of each other um, in different circumstances. Uh, but you know, for the analysis in that moment, it's really important to remain true to the facts that actually existed on the ground. Um, quick question. Please go ahead. Um I really appreciate that case study. Um, it, it helped me see how the policy operates in, in real time. Can you present a scenario in the classroom? We actually will be doing that as our case study in, uh, in this session. So yes, uh, more to come. Can I just like, just be slightly responsive to the classroom? 
So one, one thing I will say that we, we have a case study on the classroom that the ideal for the classroom would be that we're thinking not about um, how we're applying the policy because we're really trying to have classes as opposed to be in an adjudicatory role like the policy comes into play when there's a complaint when there's a when there's when someone's come and said you know something's happened that goes beyond our policies so in a classroom you know i i would i would encourage really talking to students at the beginning about the line between the kind of of speech that we can engage in and what we can't. And I would say that for the classroom situation, you know, the line between something that's just, oops, we're not being very nice here and really conduct is um, targeted pervasive speech that is that is a student to student um, expressions of hostility that 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 persist after being asked, hey, we've we've gone too far here. So we'll talk about that a little bit in the hypo, but I think it's important to remember that in the classroom, we're not acting as these sort of adjudicatory bodies saying, you know, did the speech go beyond this policy or that policy? We're trying to establish, you know, um, we can share ideas that are hard, but we're not, we're not going to engage in ad hominem attacks and we're certainly not going to, um, we're certainly not going to um, uh, target other members of the classroom with speech directed at them. Um, and if it happens once, um, you know, a reminder and that it doesn't happen again. So I, I think what I'll, one thing that I'll do is that after this, I'll send the CTRL people a handy. I do have a slide on the on when speech in the classroom crosses the line from people having a tough time to harassment. And it's a really high bar, um, but I would encourage teachers to, to think about it from the perspective of you know, speech that's not targeted, severe and pervasive or gratuitous um, and, and, um, and have that conversation with students in advance. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for that helpful question. And hopefully also the case study will, will give you a chance to brainstorm you know, with some other colleagues here um, in the context of a classroom. So I really appreciate that. Okay, so next on our panel, um, Jaris Williams from our Office of the Dean of Students, um, and Jaris has um, a lot of wonderful perspective to share, especially around, you know, if there is harm in the classroom, what happens next outside of the classroom? Um, Jaris is often really deeply involved in those kinds of conversations. So Jaris. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Amanda. So that's actually a perfect segue. Uh, I'm going to be uh, discussing the subject matter from the framework of what happens once the learning environment is impacted. And uh, Regina just spoke about it from a policy perspective. And Lara just mentioned it from a um, perspective. I think her quote was, uh, oops, um, sorry, I don't wanna butcher your quote, but like the initial impact of what someone says in the class may not be a violation of a policy, um, but still be a significant impact to that student in so much that for them, the learning environment is significantly impacted. So um, as you all have seen, uh, you know, either teaching here at other, or at other places, when a student is significantly impacted, it can play out in a number of different ways. Um, one of the ways is issues with the curriculum itself We'll talk a little bit more about this later on in our case study, um, just this association with the curriculum. Another way is issues with peers, um, interpersonal communication in class, disruptions, um, saying very rude things as Lara just mentioned a moment ago. Um, and, then and then finally, um, or I should say not limited to um, faculty uh, disruptions as well too, or interpersonal relations relationships between that student and that faculty member just being not what you would expect from a decorum perspective and from you know what most people would characterize as a traditional student to faculty relationship. Um, so that's that's very very important. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, restorative practices. Uh, the formal definition of what we have on our website is the goal of restorative practices is to repair harm and to prevent reoccurrence through a process that involves everyone that's directly most directly affected. Um, 
It is an indigenous practice that challenges students to explore, reflect, and engage with each other, um, ultimately with the intention of creating what's called a reparative agreement. And that reparative agreement will essentially help guide and direct what the interactions look like for uh, that group of students that is impacted moving forward. So the idea, if you think about kind of where many of our uh, 18 to 22 year old perspective. Actually, I, I won't just leave it there because I've had lots of conversations, intentional conversations with our graduate cohort as well, masters and doctoral, um, believe it or not. But um, the idea is not to cancel that person or throw them away. Like we consistently see if someone is perceived to be racist um, or homophobic or any other uh, ism that you can, sexist or any other ism that you can probably think of. Um, the goal is to ultimately uh, repair the relationship. Um, and if you can kind of think about it in these four areas, uh, relationships, repair, accountability, and then ultimately reintegration. And so um, I'm gonna drop uh, just the link to uh, our pages in the chat, and then you can kind of Oh, Jairus, you just went on mute as well. Oh, sorry. You can kind of see more tangibly what our processes might look like and kind of um, what goes into a restorative circle as well. Um, and then finally, uh, we also offer just general consultations with faculty. You know, if, if you're having an issue in class and wanted to think about kind of which ways to go, what are some additional resources we can talk to you and kind of have more of a consultation on what might make sense moving forward and what some potential options might be. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Jaris. So, you know, just building on a couple of key points here, I want to just just pull together a few themes um, that that I think were reflected here, um, and also invite uh, our colleagues, Caroline. Thank you for for this in the chat. I think that's exactly right. You know, as faculty members, you know, it is your responsibility to ensure a productive learning environment for all of the students in your classroom, right? That is in the service of the learning objectives of your course, right? So that, that is your job. So, so I think the question is sort of how do you do that, right? How do you do that? How do you debate ideas um, and sometimes hard ideas in a way that actually holds people's humanity together, right? We're not debating individuals, right? We're not casting out human beings, but, but how, are we, how are we debating ideas, right? that are, again, within the, the sort of um, context of, of academic rigor as we, as we understand it, as, Laura, as, as Lara put forward. So this notion of, of restoration um, that Jaris talked to, I think is really key because in the service of debating ideas, there can be harm because those things aren't separate from us as individuals, right? Depending on our positionalities and our identities and how we show up in classes and how we're situated in the world, debate of certain ideas land differently for us, we can't just intellectualize sometimes things that are really human and personal to us, especially those of us that occupy any identities that are not in kind of a majority position in whatever way, right? So, so that is really where some of this key um, work for you as a faculty member lies. And I think if I were to offer one um, idea for you as, as, as colleagues moving into the semester is remember to take the time to together with your class build um, standards for how you want to talk together, right? How are we going to talk together in this class, right? Before you get into the more complicated conversations, before these things show up, talk together about why um, and how you're going to speak with each other and what's going to happen, right? When there is a moment of harm or conflict, what are you going to do collectively? And how are you going to hold those commitments and accountabilities to each other? And then make sure that when that thing happens, you go back to those agreements, right? Um, because I think, again, this is you building that context um, for your classroom environment and rebuilding it and reassessing it, right? And, and continually sort of working to shape it in a way that creates the most um, free, ex the most free environment for people to explore um, valid and, and robust ideas, but also remembering absolutely that, that it's vital that we listen and hear each other as best we can, at, but also name, right? When there are opportunities, we as faculty members, especially given our power position in the classroom relative to our students, right, that how do we kind of name um, 
when conversations are moving in directions that are less helpful to the academic learning context? Um, and how do we reframe in a way that gets us back on track? So with that in mind, um, we've got some great ideas from our colleagues in the chat, and we hope that this next section will actually um, generate even more ideas for a more open Q&A um, later on. So what we're going to do is, is ask you um, to move into some small groups. And in these small groups, we're going to ask you to actually engage with a what, what Lara calls a hypo, a hypothetical, um, uh, com a hypothetical case study. So Lara, do you want to read it out and I can pop it here in the chat? Sure, I was just pulling it up and getting ready to pop it in, but yes, please. So here is our fact pattern and questions and Amanda will put them in the chat. Um, in a section of uh, COGOD 100, Introduction to Business, students are asked to consider the Dakota Access Pipeline as a case study of the complex interactions between businesses, communities, and governments. The professor asked students to work in small groups to devise Energy Transfer Inc. on improving its operations. That's the prime shareholder of, of, of the DAPL. Some students object to the exercise, arguing that asking them to represent DAPL's largest shareholder was tantamount to arguing against tribal sovereignty and deeply hurtful to indigenous students. Um, and we'd like you to consider this fact pattern and then consider questions, including how would you communicate with these students? What steps, if any, might a faculty member take in laying the groundwork in advance for an exercise like this one? What issues of academic freedom and free expression might be in play here? Um, what are the issues relating to inclusion and civil dialogue? And what, if any, um, uh, measures might you take regarding um, reparative, uh, reparative measures in, in light of the hurt and moving, moving forward. I'll say, um, I, think, um, I think our CTRL friends are gonna move you into breakout rooms. I'd also like you to consider as you um, in particular think about the groundwork lane, do you in your classes, in your practice, talk to students at any time in the semester about what class time is for and what class discussion is for and incorporate that reflection if, if you can in, into your approach. Okay, so before we send you to breakouts, let me ask a if there are any clarifying questions for, in terms of what, what you're about to do um, or the scenario itself. So not into any of the substance of, of the conversation, but actually um, into the assignment itself. Any clarifying questions, feel free to un unmute yourself or use the chat if that's easier. Okay. All right, so if anyone has a clarifying question, um, those of us who are on the panel, or, or at least I will hang out here in the main room, you, you feel free. If you didn't want to call it out out loud, you are more than welcome to jump into um, the main room and ask a question there. But I will repost these questions and this this scenario so you've got them in your in your small groups as well. So. We look forward to chatting with your colleagues and coming back and sharing a little bit about the context of your discussion. Okay. Amanda, I made four rooms. I Could you good. make more rooms? Do you yes, mind? Sorry, yes. those are no, a little no, large. Yeah, 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 awesome. Thank you so much. Looks like the breakout rooms are going to close. Yeah, I just have to create more rooms. Sorry. I, I, oh, got it. Yeah. Sorry, I had, 
I had created some on my own. So I, I didn't want to push if you were going to push, but um, I think about, you know, six folks in a room is a good. Okay. So those of you that are still with us in the main room, hopefully you see a invitation to join into a breakout room where we're gonna be discussing a scenario. So if you look and see, you may have so the reason been... why you're seeing everyone appearing because the breakout rooms were shut were, down. Were they only yeah. a minute long? Because that's no, no, long. that wasn't a speed discussion. That was a technological snafu. Oh, Not to worry, everyone. Like enough. Oh, <laughs> Are you sure enough. you couldn't talk about free expression and inclusion in one minute? You weren't able to do that. All right, F for everyone. No, sorry, that was a technological snafu. Um, we're gonna get it fixed back up and send and you we're all going back, back into... into the same one. Okay, go oh, different ones. It may be new people. It was like you know, quick, smaller, smaller, mm -hmm. smaller discussions. Enjoy. Oh, room three is going to be real small, <laughs> but that's okay. Should someone go jump in? Should, Jairus went. Okay. Should one of us maybe go join room uh, three? Diana and Edward and Jairus are there right now. Um, Fanta and I and Shed were all um, ended up in that that room. But I, I mean, the three of them can just, like, that's not a bad. It's not a bad thing. Okay. I feel like it, when I when I do breakouts on Zoom teaching, I usually shoot for like, you know, five, six people. But when yeah. I do breakouts in classrooms, I usually do three or four. And I actually think you can have a perfectly wonderful discussion of a fact pattern with three or four people. Or at least I hope they're having good discussion. Good. Yeah. <laughs> People say that you want to uh, accomplish. Say they like it. I think I'm going to broadcast a message again with the prompt, just in case it deleted. You know what I mean? Since we yeah. did the breakout rooms, um, except it's a little shorter. So let me see. So is there an option here for students to not represent that group for this assignment? I think they could. Uh... So that's a great question. Um, and I hope that people um, bring that up. Okay. Um, it'd be interesting because I think, you know, in my um, classes, I often very specifically, almost always very specifically assign people to take one perspective or other. Um, but what I do is I do that with real, um, I, I don't tend to design anything that would make you gotten yeah represent a truly reprehensible position um so like you could be representing somebody who did something bad but on a principle like free expression that that's not inherently so um hey everyone welcome back hope you had a chance to at least dip your toe in this very complex um and and rich conversation so we have about 10 minutes left. Wanted to welcome um, some open dialogue, some open Q&A. So either issues that emerged in your small groups um, or burning questions that you have more generally. Um, so the, the floor is yours. Please feel free to use your hand raise function. Feel free to um, just open your mic and, and chat out whatever feels, feels right. Yes, I see David. Good morning. I just wanted to say that one thing that occurs to me that I think we discussed to some degree was a background or sort of a, a basic question as to whether or not people feel as if their existences are respected in the class. And if there's a discussion 
that appears to be for closing the point of view or the very existence of a class member, that's an opportunity for the instructor to set some limits and suggest that we all must have that base level of respect for one another. Yeah, helpful. Thank you, Thank you David. Appreciate that. Anyone want to build on that or or offer a, a different idea or line of thinking? Well, I guess going down that path, you know, one thing that I, the first thing that kind of struck me when I was reading this and I had mentioned when we first formed our group was that, you know, if you go to the last line, like last larger shareholder was Tanchima to argue against tribal sovereignty and deeply hurtful to indigenous students. But are there indigenous students in there? Are they speaking for indigenous students, right? Or are you speaking yeah. for yourself? Which in this case, you should be speaking for yourself, right? So you should say, like, I think this is how, you know, it, it would be for other people and we need to discuss this um, and make sure not to speak for indigenous students um, is something I think is of value and importance. So I think that's kind of going off of what David was saying and just in, in, in making sure that everyone feels uh, validated in what they're trying to do and make sure that you're not stepping on other people's toes or making presumptions while doing that. Appreciate that, Arthur. The sort of problematic allyship that is also speaking for another group, especially if it's a group that's maybe not represented in the room while not spotlighting, right? Any one individual you may have in the group as their perspective having to speak for the whole or that being the only part of their identity that they might, might want to speak for in that in that moment. Yeah, that's really helpful. And just to piggyback off of that, something Carolyn said, um, she said that it's important not to force the student to identify or represent um, or essentialize the culture or religion or race or whatever it is to any single um, factor. So it's, it's very important that we're not isolating a student or assuming anything about the student, despite the fact that we want to protect the student's um, perspective and um, opinions and everything like that. So it's just a tricky place. You want to be, you want to identify, you want to protect everybody and be proactive, but you don't want to force anybody to represent um, or pull out an identity that may not be theirs to begin with. Our, our group was talking about different teaching techniques to allow voice to come across authentically. And I'm sure others can think of it, but you know, some of it is also thinking about the learning materials that you integrate into that case study. For example, could you find primary source material um, of voices representing different perspectives of that particular case study? Um, so yeah, just a really rich discussion. We should have had 30 more minutes for the breakout rooms. Absolutely, key points by you both. I think that those are those are great takeaways. Thank you. Anyone else want to build on this? Not on that per se, but I did ask about when the hello. Um, Hi. Asking about the groundwork um, to a faculty. Um, how much did they know that these type of discussions or they may have been put in, they had to be put in a different role than in their opinion at the beginning? Was it introduced in the syllabus? was it, you know, that way people will know, or maybe in advance, you can say, these are the topics we're gonna have, have people sign up for it. Like some people may be okay with do the, doing an opposing view and versus you signing them up for it. So allowing the students maybe to select, and I am not a faculty, so I will say that, um, but that is some things that they can do. Um, just let them know in advance. That is such an important point. And I think one thing, you know, so I think it's it's a reasonably well-crafted hypo because it, it got lots of lots of conversation going. But one important thing, right, is like we're we all came together, we're a group, we we launched in, said hello, and, and worked on this. With our classes, you know, just dropping this exercise on day one, you know, or something like it not a great idea. And we do, we, we have a strange thing with classes because we have three months. We're a, a learning community of people who come together by virtue of either being assigned in or registering in. It's a new group. I would recommend, especially to new faculty, don't assume your students know each other <laughs> and don't even assume your students learn each other's names um, in the course of a semester, unless you facilitate that. And I do, I do name cards on the desks. Um, 
and and you and I found out really after teaching a couple of years, someone was like, you know that girl who always wears like a red sweatshirt who sits kind of in front of me. She said, and I'm like, that's you know that's Jessica. It's like and and they didn't know each other, and now that's changed. But that groundwork laying is really important, including naming that when you study anything worth studying, it affects human beings. We can't essentialize how it will affect given human beings based on their identity. What we can do is be mindful and try and also really lay that groundwork, which means that by the time you have a conversation like this one or any hard one, people have established a few principles that they've hopefully bought into that haven't been externally imposed. People have bought into some practices and promises um, about how this is gonna work, including understanding that it can be bruising, understanding that people will try and make mistakes, understanding that there are power dynamics involved in any conversation about rules and power structures, um, and understanding that we're speaking from the per shared perspective of students and scholars, which means a degree of generosity toward people who are works in progress with the material, but also a real personal commitment to take that feedback about your impact or your, your progress and do better tomorrow. But it also means giving your classmates an opportunity to do better tomorrow. And that's what, you know, Jaris mentioned, restorative approaches. We can be restorative as educators saying we actually are going to call in when people get it wrong, including faculty. But the idea behind this is educational. The goal is always that I'm going to be better at this tomorrow than I was today, which means listening and that groundwork in a course to make it a space where this is what people are doing together is is just um, it's essential. Um, and if I could just pull, I mean, I think Lara was there and we started this discussion before the breakout rooms and now, but remembering that as the adult in the room, be that the faculty member or the advisor to the organization or whatever, that you too are a member of that community. And that when the critique is directed at you, there is equal opportunity to model what it is to receive critique thoughtfully and, you know, engage in course correction if that's appropriate or do that restorative work as an equal member um, of that community again acknowledging you know power and and those sorts of things um and if i may from you know some of my perspective and past experience also kind of flip that on its head also to remind you all that as members of this community, you also deserve to be treated appropriately in the workspace. Um, and so where, you know, things are being directed at the faculty or staff member that may be harassing or inappropriate or otherwise, like to really just remind that that you also deserve to be in a space, um, you know, where you're treated as a, as a member of the community who's respected. I do want to say something. I know we have to wrap up, but Virginia, you make a, such a good point. I'm learning that here at AU that sometimes this, this school seems so into caring for the student and their well-being. There is something missing to taking everything that student said that an adult did or a staff did, because they're adults too, and just taking it for a grain and then turning this adult into the bad person or the person who didn't do something right. It's almost like there is no realization either by the student or someone trying to solve the problem that there's a background of the, the the staff or faculty too and how did that interaction affect them it seems to be so one-sided and it's doing a disservice to the staff or fa people working with the student because you're it's it, I became so fearful of like saying the wrong thing to the student and if I say something that's normal it's perceived in a wrong way and it gets up to another level. And before I know it, I'm being counseled for just a minor, hey, you didn't do this right. So I think there needs to be something where they everyone gets voices heard, but also respected. And it's losing something. Really and important just point. Finally, in closing, I think I'll, I'll also add, I think this is a great opportunity with um, the way we have perceived our policies around free speech, living in COVID-19, living in the pandemic with COVID-19 and masks on, masks off, absences, how we view our and create our syllabi, like all of those pieces combined to really review internally our perceptions of what cosmopolitanism means. 
for us and, 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 and what that looks like um, when we are creating our syllabi and responding to students who are in need. So I'll close there. Thank you, everyone. As you know, we are just barely scratching the surface here. There's so much more to say and do and some really good feedback and thoughts from uh, participants here. We wanna invite you. I hope it's okay with CTRL. Uh, we are going, we would love to have a follow-up session where we do some more hypotheticals and really dive deeper into some of the power dynamics um, at work and how they can show up in very particular contexts. So uh, stay tuned. We will, we will certainly email this group via the CTRL platform when we've got that all set up. And we are really deeply grateful for your engagement, your really thoughtful ideas in the chat that, um, and for the work we know you'll do ahead. So please, I hope you'll see us as resources and each other as resources moving forward in this work. Deep gratitude to everybody. Um, good luck with the rest of the semester and many, many thanks. Thanks, everyone. Before we go, quick question. I don't know if Shed or mm -hmm. uh, Naziha, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly.